the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ebro, Laura, Rosenberg. Good morning, everyone. And um, I'm very excited. I just took over. I put, I said, I told Ebro and Laura to chill because my dude is here. The one and only Cody Rhodes is in the building and in New York. Barkley Center tonight. When was the last time Cody Rhodes appeared on a Raw in New York? Uh, gosh, I mean, whether it be Barkley's or whether it be MSG, I think it has been six, seven years. What is, is what kind of, what, you, what does it feel like right now? Like just being back. Um, first of all, your comeback a, a year ago was amazing, but now coming back again after injury, are you just psyched to get there to get to work every week? It's it's. One of these things where I really, I didn't like the final month before I came back in the first place. I really couldn't sleep anyways. I was having to try everything I possibly could just to quiet my mind down and go to sleep because I was really giddy, very giddy about returning to, to wrestling. I don't know if giddy is the most m masculine of words, <laughs> but uh, very giddy. And But also at the same time, giddy is what got me in trouble lifting and just going nuts because i was so excited and i felt so much responsibility uh this time i've i've just tried to be calm and cool and, and come in and 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 do my thing and and help in the best way i can not the wwe needs help but uh it did feel like there was this absence uh, on raw perhaps and I'm really glad I could maybe it was just my absence and I'm glad to jump back in and and take that responsibility Well, I, I think the abs I think the second you showed up after at mania last year mm -hmm. I think immediately fans were like oh we needed a guy like this to root for on Mondays like that It's a three-hour show it and is. you know and and then Smackdown of course has been Roman's show for a very long time yeah. He was driving that show from an entertainment standpoint for so long raw did actually need something else So when you showed up and you made that impact and then you went away Yeah, I think you were missed right away. You could feel a, an absence that there was no Cody. It's nice It's nice to be missed <laughs> and uh, I having grown up in the company I appreciate Smackdown for all it is and being on Fox and all that wonderfulness there but Raw is still the flagship show. It, I, and it almost seems like a, a, maybe a younger generation of fans. Some of the kids, for example, that we have at the Nightmare Factory, I ask, hey, what are you watching and this and that. I feel, feel maybe they forgot that it's the flagship show. And it, it, I mean, it's the flagship show. You've got Bianca on there. You've got Seth on there. You've got Becky on there. I'm back on there. And plus, there's so much crossover. We're in the mania season where the walls are down anyways. Yeah, yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. Paul Heyman last week. But for it to be the flagship show, Cena being one of my biggest role models in the business, that's kind of the individual you want to pattern your steps after. And he's one that I've tried to do that and be very proud of being on Raw, being back on Raw. Before you went to AEW, I was fascinated. Was it Rolling Stone? Who wrote the big article? Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone article. Yeah, they came well, to Hammerstein to watch us to watch us do our thing. Yeah. And the story they they told though about you and your dad and then what you wanted to accomplish. It's really what actually made me invest more into oh. what was happening with uh, you and the emergence of AEW. Um, did it? Did that whole thing before we get to what you're doing now? Yeah. Did that whole thing go essentially go as you would have hoped it would have? I think um, nothing really. A lot of people will look at it now and be like, "What a plan! What a master plan!" It really wasn't a plan. You know, the first goal I had in the entire business, and this is an honest, true goal, I was able to share this the night after WrestleMania, was I was eight years old. I wanted to win the WWE Championship because my dad had never won it, and I wanted to hand it to him. That was the first goal I'd ever had. And now on the road to WrestleMania, I have this opportunity to do part of that goal. But after I left um, from my first run with WWE, my goal was really about connection you know, sometimes when I had grown up in the WWE system, so I felt like maybe I hadn't reached across the aisle enough. Maybe I hadn't done a lot, enough grassroots. And that, then it became, I mean, a small spoiler, I guess. I, I was trying to come up with this idea for a weight belt for a very specific PLE or pay-per-view, whatever you want to call it, where I wrote every independent promotion I worked at on it. Uh, because that was the most important thing I did was these, this connection with these fans and, and getting to know them and grassroots. And, and that became really my bread and butter. But then a plan still hadn't developed. So I, I can't say it went the way I thought or it went the way I, I didn't think as much as I'm just really proud 
of every step on the way. It was very much a broken road and very much you think you're going in a straight line to reach your destiny or your path, but you're, you're all over the place. I think I said that, you know, you often find your destiny on the, the road you take to avoid it. Um, so, so my plan was win the WWE championship. Then my second plan was do the most you possibly can for wrestling. Uh, make sure guys and girls are getting paid, paid more, make sure that the infrastructure is better, make sure that there's structure. So as far as that, I think, we did accomplish that, and uh, I was part of accomplishing that. So when you gave you yeah. cre you created, I think undeniably, you know, regardless of how you feel about each product, mm -hmm. by doing what you guys did, you created another place. Like this is why I always argue that the existence of AEW is good for WWE. Sure, you created another place where people can work on television and make money and develop their craft. Yeah. They may not do it always in a way that I think I regularly watch and go. Well, that wouldn't work at WWE, yeah. and those things can be taught, but I still think it's valuable when there's more jobs for people to get, and that if it doesn't work out for you in the WWE system, you're just not the fit, there's another place to aspire to go to, um, yeah. independent-wise, and then importantly, to get TV as well. Um, because that's an important piece. Like a lot of people may be great on the indies, but when they show up at TV and have to figure out how to deal with cameras, it's a whole different operation. It is. I almost look at it like different forms of education. Whereas WWE is the biggest, the best. I mean, you were looking at Patrick Mahomes this morning holding his version of the, the WWE title after after winning the Super Bowl. But it's a hundred. I'm glad. I hope you don't have to argue that with many people. It's absolutely good for the industry to have these options because sometimes critics of, of what we do think, oh, they're, this is who this person is. Oh, he's stardust. He's always stardust. Oh, he's dashing Cody Rhodes. He's always this. Gosh, no, really. You don't, you don't finish where you start. It's all about learning and shaping and, and owning your mistakes and failures. The, the greatest teacher. And I, I definitely hit some speed bumps and tripped quite a bit uh, in my, my final, final year uh, away. But coming back without all of that, I wouldn't have been, I feel like, as complete as I am now. But it's absolutely nice to have those options. Um, again, there's no war. No war. Uh, and especially amongst locker rooms. If you're putting your boots on girls and boys, we're we're bonded. We're brothers and we're sisters. Uh, there's no war. That's a real yeah. point that's missed by fans a lot. That like yeah. I don't I don't like I can't emphasize enough how like everyone's just it's a small industry. So like Very. everyone wants their friends to be successful. No one's being like, I really hope obviously everyone wants to be the best themselves. Um I will say uh, last thing on your on your uh your past prior to coming back to WWE. Um what obviously you took some friendships with you though that are pretty tight. Uh, everyone yeah. knows you're really tight with Ricky Starks. Um, uh, apparently, uh, everyone knows that, that. Everyone knows that, that. weird security cam <laughs> photo uh, or whatever it was. Yeah, interesting how that got out there. Mm. Um, but who uh, is there? Anyone else that you like? I'm sure there's lots of people, but anyone else in particular that you have a relationship where you've given them, imparted them with lots of uh, advice and wisdom? I mean, there was a huge group of. That was my favorite part about having that job was the the leadership aspect of it. I don't, I don't know if I was good at it or not, but I we had. A well, book. some would some would say it appeared that after you left, things got a little worse. So, well, I mean, like we had we had like a book club. We would. Uh, it's not a place. Wait, wrestling where, books or all kinds of books? just all kinds of books. Like okay. Batman Hush was a graphic novel. It was like the first okay. one. Um, <laughs> We'd pass out biographies to to younger guys and girls that maybe didn't get that experience, and I'm I'm not the person who wrote that book, so they're. And maybe that person's passed on, but I know I had talked to them so they can get something from this. Um, I, I honestly consider everybody there somebody, I'm, even people who are there now who they're in this this company that, that I helped create, I'm proud of in a sense, um, just because that's a cool f feather in your cap. But I mean, I all of them, I don't look at them so much from an aspect of friendliness. I'd say like Wardlow and I are friends. But the other ones I look at from the aspect of they were, they were, I don't want to say students because they weren't, but I was able to help them. So I'm, I'm proud of them in that sense, in terms of as they develop promos and as their matches change and as their physiques come alive, guys and girls, it was, I mean, it was a pretty long list. Uh, even the ones that were a little bit, you know, wrestlers and creators sometimes were like this, 
you know, button heads on putting stuff together. But even those ones, I still have a feeling of, of pride over and I'll never not. Um, I don't expect any of them to raise their hand and be like, hey, Cody really helped me. I for a minute did and took it a little personally that that, that didn't happen. But that's not why you give. No. You, and you and you rarely get that back, right? You get you give blindly, most of, especially wrestlers. And then when you die, yeah. you get really nice tweets. So I always say like this big fear I had, and now it's gone. I don't have this fear anymore. But my dad's career was really revised while he was alive. Just the other night, I'm talking to Paul Heyman about this 2000 ECW run. That was a period where everyone had like ostracized him from the industry and. And then he passed away and all those same people wrote the nicest, kindest things and they kind of gave him his due. And WWE continues to give him his due because his kids are out there still, not me. I'm The ones he, Paul mentioned it, people like Roman, people like Kevin, people like Sammy. Everybody, everybody yeah. So uh, I was always afraid that maybe my contributions from that perspective will be denied. But again, that's not why you give... And in this era of everyone's got the receipts, half the events and things like last time we spoke, we were speaking about something differently. It's all on the record what we did. So I don't need to worry about it anymore. I just need to worry about what I do next. I totally appreciate that. Believe me, like that's something I, I think I appreciate your honesty about that because I think ego wise, those things are hard. I think about it all the time with things that I do. Like I hope people know that. And then you're like, you got to just kind of do what you do. And the story, yeah. is, it's all out there. Is that it? What's it like for you being the child of someone who had a bond with so many of your colleagues? I mean, like, he's your dad, but he was a father figure to practically everybody in that locker room, it seems. It's it's something I didn't get adjusted to, adjusted to till recently. I even, I remember speaking to Triple H about this, like, last week. I don't know if I got adjusted till till just... When coming back at the Rumble, almost. Um, the reason being is, yeah, he was he was my father, and I was his biggest fan, and we talked about wrestling all the time. But he didn't train me. Uh, he did give me two bumps when I was 15 years old, a hip toss and a body slam, to let me know how the ring felt, and it felt bad. And after that, he let someone else train me. He sent me to Florida a little bit, and then I went to Ohio Valley Wrestling, of course. Who was the first person he sent you to? The first people he sent me to were this these guys people who follow tna will know them it was a bruno and tilly are their names okay and uh huge i think tilly's the big one like 400 okay. i remember at my first week which was like get ready for ovw week he gave me a leg drop off the top rope that i thought would decapitate me it didn't it was uh, he was a pro um <laughs> But yeah, he, he sent me all around, different different places. And at Turnbuckle Championship Wrestling, which was his office, he wouldn't let me have a full match with the training group. It was a lot of power plant guys like Ray Lloyd. But as soon as the door shut, those guys were really cool about, all right, Cody, get in here. All right, all right, we're going to call it to you as you go. If your dad comes in, just keep hitting the ropes. Because I was allowed to hit the ropes, but I wasn't allowed to have a full match. So they were in on the bit with me. I'd be in there. <laughs> getting a match called to me at 15 years old while I was still in my amateur wrestling season. Uh, but again, he stepped out. Then I got called up to Raw in 2007, and he was on the writing team, and he stepped out. Uh, and he told Arn Anderson and Ed Kosky and a few people, like, hey, you know, look out for, look out for him, Arn particularly. And Arn took it in a deliberate, like, I'm going to be really hard on him uh, since, which I now really greatly respect. Uh, didn't know at the time, but th that meant like to your point, I never got these big conversations about what it's going to be like under the lights at Raw, what it's going to be like when you do this thing with Rey Mysterio. And even when he would come in for little pieces with me, whether it was a thing I did with Ray in Sacramento or whether it was as far as the battleground stuff with me and Dustin, he never divulged. I just got to watch him perform. He never talked. Why not? Why, why did he... I think, you know, Paul Heyman will tell you because maybe he didn't think I was ready. And Paul Heyman always has also said that he treated me like I was the daughter of the family. Very proud, his pride and joy, but also maybe didn't look at in a sense that I was going to move forward in the wrestling space. Right. I think it was just because he he never wanted to have a bad discussion with me he never want, he, he wanted to be proud of me support me but he never wanted to have a real talk about wrestling because it is a hey getting into pro wrestling getting into sports entertainment this day is so easy making it making it financially and on screen from an optic standpoint everything making it is i mean 
almost impossible getting out of the lower to the middle card. And maybe, maybe he was, I think he had all the confidence in the world in me, but I just think he wanted me to do it totally on my own, which is funny because I mentioned him so much in these interviews and stuff. And there is a side of the audience that's like, why is he always talking about his, his dad? And, uh, it's, it's, it's hard during this run to WrestleMania to not talk about him because the specifics of getting this title that he never got is also shouldered with what I just told you about trying to kind of vindicate this legacy and career he had. But I mean, really, really to summarize, it almost felt like he was creating these opponents. Like I look at Seth, I'm like, this guy was built partially by my dad and it's my job to beat him. That's a weird, that's like playing on the other side. So your dad's the head coach. Yes. And you're the quarterback on the other team. Correct. It's a odd, odd dynamic. But again, also the secret of being a second or third generation is really simply you love them, you're proud of them, but you don't want to be them. You want to be better than them. And when you say that out loud, people are like, oh, what a, what a jerk. Like, how's he going to be better than Dusty Rhodes? Or how's Ashley going to be ready to, you know, better than Ric Flair? Well, we don't grow up just, hey, we're just going to be them. You want to be better. That's, that's the hardest thing to tell somebody. And I think that's maybe why we never really became a student and a teacher because he knew I was trying to come up and be better. He knew I was trying to re replace the older lion and as strange as that is, finally adjusted to it, I suppose. Did, did your brother get a different version? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm uh, I'm real excited because uh, A and E is doing this documentary on Dusty. Yeah, uh, I believe it comes out the, gosh, I think Dusty's airs the week before Mania. Okay, and it's told through the eyes of his four children. So my sister Teal, my half sister Kristen, and my half you know Dustin. Vastly different, and um, the hardest thing about it, and I, I was the executive producer on the documentary, and I really wanted to be fair to everybody. The hardest thing about it is there's an interview he did about two weeks before he passed that I'd never seen. Oh, wow. And he really owns the first part of his life. You know, the second part of his life was my part. It was great. Never missed a wrestling match. Was the ultimate team dad. Uh, did everything I could. And, like, you know, never gave me those hard conversations. Just believed in me fully. Dustin mm -hmm. and Kristen had a different life. And to see that and see how we kind of have all come together. It's a very unique way to tell the story. I didn't agree with the way the story was being told until I saw the first cut of it and thought, yep, that's, that's it. This is how it should so be. You, so you guys, so you, you, you had that essential that this is a very common experience. The first marriage, first set of kids yeah. didn't get it right. Second time around knew how to be a dad. Um, yeah, just a different experience. I mean, this, that's a that's a kind of a story old as time. Um, a lot of dudes, yeah. they get into it the first time thinking they're ready to be a dad, and lo and behold, they're not. Yeah. Um, mm. Did your what kind of role did Dustin play in your life as a kid? Did he and and did he train you at all as well? Would nope. He, gave you zero. <laughs> he, uh, I mean, he always was. He was more helpful as far as we would get in the ring together, and he actually came to my amateur wrestling practices, and he'd wrestle with me on the mat which was fun because we'd really go at it. And that was, we did not have a childhood together. So that was unique. How much older is he? 16 years. Wow. Um, but Dustin, I don't give Dustin enough credit as far as how important Dustin was to me growing up. And, and how I know how important he was, was I'd go to the Omni shows in Atlanta and Dustin would go out maybe to wrestle stunning Steve Austin uh, or, uh, you know, Brad Armstrong. And he got what, you know, they don't exist anymore really. Or maybe they do. He got what we used to call a chick pop where all the women would just go nuts over him. And he was also so tall. And I thought, I, w I remember being there and thinking, yeah, I came here for Sting, but that's my favorite wrestler. You know, it was my brother. And uh, I don't I don't ever, you know, talk to him about that or I never really told him that. I have now, you know, but again, it's how brothers talk. You don't want to get on that emotional level. But I don't give him enough credit as somebody, even as a teenager when gold dust was happening, um, I was a bit of an old soul. I had figured out this, I wasn't, it didn't shock me. I get what he was trying to do, entertain people. And maybe he was the bad guy in the entertainment segment. But, uh, yeah, I, I, he's one of my favorite wrestlers and I don't give him enough credit. And then having been in the ring with him when we tagged together or when we wrestled one another, he is one of, uh, top five that I've ever touched in terms of how quick he is, in terms of his uh, his general communication, in terms of his conditioning. And he's 
50 something years old. That's crazy. Yeah, I always tell him. He my, still doesn't look like he's taken that, you know, that yeah. old man slowdown. Like, I haven't seen it yet from him. No. He still looks like him. He hits the ropes like Luke Gallows hits the ropes where you can hear the ping, yeah. you know, uh, and he doesn't have a saddle walk. He's also not doing f two hours of prep work before you go out there to bring himself back. He's just a great athlete. I've, he got a lot of that athleticism from Dusty. People don't realize how good of an athlete Dusty was because he looked the way he looked, uh, especially on the basketball court or on the baseball field. Um, yeah, so he, he's a, Dustin's one of my favorite wrestlers, doesn't get enough credit, uh, very, very proud of him and also proud his daughter Dakota is a photographer in wrestling now. And I feel like that's, I'm just happy, you know, the industry continues to, you know, whatever they choose to do, all these grandkids and my own daughter now, whatever we, they choose to do, but I'm not going to look at the the business as a bad place. It's a good place. How do you reconcile the sort of weird relationship between WWE and your dad? Be it's mm. like, it's mm. very confusing. Yeah. You know, like in one sense, he is so revered and treated with such unbelievable respect like up there among the most respected names I believe ever in the company when you hear about the Pat Pattersons. It's yeah. a, you hear Dusty Rhodes, like his name really garners that kind of respect. But at the same time, you hear the stories that the, the, the you know, Virgil was a rib on your dad yeah. and um, the African dream, all these different things. Hakeem. It's, I just find it very confusing. And I imagine that you must have found it somewhat confusing too. So one of the things, again, not to just, I'm, I'm so proud of this, this documentary. And one of the things I was told as a kid was that right after, you know, we're right down the street, we're talking about March 12th, the garden. And right after these garden shows with superstar Billy Graham, that Vince McMahon wanted to use Dusty and superstar for his expansion, his expansion that would become what we know as far as where we work and all the biggest global sports entertainment wrestling and an entity on the planet by far but they had they had booked like recording studio time they were going to make an album this is again before oh, rock yeah, and yeah. wrestling but vince had these ideas of reaching out beyond oh. pro wrestling and i'll tell you as a kid hearing that story from dusty i didn't believe it i thought it was you know i'm watching vhs's of coliseum video hulk hogan and ultimate warrior and i thought it, it was his way of catching up to me, like hey i was really special too i was really good too and he didn't need to do that but i everyone's got an ego come to find out one day i'm sitting by the ring this is before i left i'm still doing stardust and vince told me the exact story how mad he was that dad left and he was going to give him the whole world and he wanted him to be the hogan and and all this and then i remember my dad telling me about how hogan used to come to championship wrestling from florida and watch him and uh, revered him and it just sounded like oh you're just trying to kind of chase that Until you heard it from vince and then i heard it from vince and then i heard it from hogan and then i heard it from bruce pritchard and again it was something i was like we i hope we cover this on the documentary because i consider dusty Rhodes a mount rushmore guy and not because he's my dad if it's my if his son mount rushmore i'm putting just four dusties right but i consider him that from the industry perspective uh closed circuit becoming pay-per-view the big event uh the idea of the sizzle uh matching the substance to a degree especially with what him and superstar did in the garden that's why the garden is so dang special to me um but this this was a very help it was great to get this part of the story out there and to hear it from bruce as well and then again like you say he comes in he's past his prime and to hear this word well now we've and got put him, him in the polka dots and they yeah. do the whole thing and blah blah it's by the way still turned out i just do want to say we always kind of like yeah the whole common man song is awesome and so there good. was really great stuff that happened there too but yeah. you can't help but look at it so that's interesting and so so vince felt spurned by dusty yeah and 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 then he i don't believe he took it out on him and if you hear it from vince himself he just thought he was past his prime let's do some fun stuff got it but when i try to t when i try to tell fans that the polka dots wasn't a rib they it's one of those things where they they will argue with me on it. <laughs> and I don't want to argue about this stuff. Like, right. I, I, hey, well, however you feel. In the past, I tried to argue it. No, it wasn't a rib. It was, you know, he was a bit older. He's past his prime. Let's have some fun. The only thing I can offer a substance that it wasn't a rib is he was in major rivalries. Ted DiBiase, 
Macho, Macho King yeah. at WrestleMania, bringing Liz back to the rig, uh, Big Boss Man. I mean, he was in major rivalries for the tiny amount of time he was there. He was prominent the whole time he was there. He was prominent the whole time he was there. He was on before intermission or on last, depending on where Hogan wanted to go on the card. He he made them, you know, my mom will tell you, now the secret of our finances is slightly more out on the surface because of my myself but my mom will tell you is also where he made the most money he'd ever made in his career and prior to that he had been executive producer and a top talent with the nwa so i just i don't mind when people are like oh they just they don't love the roads i like the narrative about the mcmahon's maybe pushing the roads a bit it's a fun narrative well and it could lead to a really fun story if you want to tell it <laughs> it also there also might be some truth in it you know right Vin, sure there might be vince is this adonis in the terms of the physique and what he wanted maybe we don't check his box however we still all come together with these random royal families of wrestling, and we still offer what we offer. And uh, I want to just make it make it clear how high up uh, we are on the list. I get the opportunity opportunity to do this at WrestleMania. So March twelfth, you'll be at the Garden, mm -hmm. and the Garden's an interesting place. I don't know if this this is something you've watched recently, but do you, your dad and Roman's dad. Had two matches at the Garden. I've been told. I actually, if you're about to tell me this, I. I feel bad. I don't know this. So I figured you might not. So my okay. shout out to my friend Brian Mann. Um, I know Brian Mann, yeah, I think. You do. He, he, you were actually in the same kindergarten. Uh, not the same classroom, but the same school. But you didn't know him then. Which one, Lovejoy or Garrison Mill? Because I, I, I think Garrison Mill. I doubled up at kindergarten, folks. He <laughs> was an old, older kid. But he did. Uh, Brian recently did the video. He did an awesome job. He made a video of um, your story with... He has a YouTube channel called Outside Interference. Got it. And I'm trying to remember which story of yours he told on there, but it was phenomenally done, Your one of your AW stories. Anyways, he, he told me yesterday, because he's working on potentially a new one, he said, did you know that Cody's dad and Sika had two matches at the Garden? Mm. One was a six-man and one was a tag. Um, so there is some history there with your wow. dads also, um, which I thought was a pretty cool twist too. And they're on YouTube. They, well, at least one of them is findable. I mean, the the ultimate question is, what was the, what was the finish? Right, I, know, I, I the, don't know the finish yet. I mean, <laughs> if I'd really been a professional, done my research, Greg, can you help us find it's out? It's almost better to not know. To just, of course, I I knew they interacted. Of course that, and and something too about my dad was he was really big when we were at wrestling events or we were backstage, um, or if I was going to be backstage or if I was watching somebody that had legacy in the business. Like I remember I watched road dog on raw and he explained to me who he was mm -hmm. he had that he had been in the you know marines he gave me a story with that a story that no fan would know watching and then ultimately they would cover it on raw as well but he was really big about just the samoans in general when we'd see him in the green room at wrestlemania or anything watching them interact was very fun there was a l layer of respect that was really special um, it's one of the reasons, like, I won't sit down until Undertaker sits down. I won't break a handshake with The Rock until he breaks it. <laughs> um, these guys, I tell my kids at the Nightmare Factory this, the business doesn't move forward without them. Like, it isn't just going to be here tomorrow. Right. You have to continuously make it here tomorrow. And without what, you know, all of uh, Roman's family did and what my family did and, and these these greats, it doesn't move forward. So it's really wild looking at the WrestleMania poster and seeing a Rhodes, a Flair. It's just... It's pretty cool. It's pretty It's pretty unique. Um, can you... I like sometimes, I got to tell you, I sometimes can't... The last time I did an interview with you in your WWE days was you did Cheap Heat with Stardust. me and Shoemaker as Stardust. Yeah, and... You were very funny, and you stayed in character the entire interview. Um, we still have drops that we have of we, that we play of you saying my name. You're really funny and entertaining, but at the same time, would I have been able to guess like, oh, a time's going to come when he's going to leave and he's going to come back, and when he comes back, he's going to get the ultimate treatment, the number one guy treatment. I mean, mm. your return at Mania was. An absurd return. I, I would yeah. have to think and count on one hand returns that I can recall being that way. Yeah. And immediately are the number one good guy on Raw. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, th there's a woman who's uh, who's helping me out in our, who's helping me and my fiance out at home clean the clean the apartment this weekend. And her husband told me, "Oh, you know, my my wife's a, a rescue." So I, he goes, "I didn't know. I didn't know you do SmackDown TV." I said, "I said, uh, yeah, I do. I do WWE." And I saw her and I said. I said, I'm going to be interviewing Cody Rhodes tomorrow. She was like, 
oh my Aww. god you know and and she was like cody rhodes and i have to tell you i'm like mm. i don't know that i pictured a time where a random you know 50 something 60 something year old lady would go oh my god cody rhodes you didn't see it coming when i did you were did, doing you, the, when did you, you was... always know that that would happen eventually one of the reasons people i think again the polka dots is not unlike stardust where i if i try to explain stardust is like a facebook status it's complicated there were things about it I really did love, but then there were things about it that hurt so much. And one of the reasons I always did everything in full gimmick, I was not able to do it halfway. I would have broke doing it. I, okay, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. I was wearing my knee pads for that interview. Um, at six, <laughs> like I had to be fully uh, in it and fully committed to it. But one of the things that was on the negative side of it is it made me not see things that were coming as a kid all i ever wanted was the the top position the franchise spot uh to win the championship that my dad never won and uh all of that but stardust got me so far away where you start to finally ask yourself okay and i've never had one but what's your plan b okay uh, can you live with this? Can you live? And the answer was no. You know, uh, Brandy's told that story about me getting out of the car at the Scran Best Western and throwing a Yoohoo bottle against Rock's face on the side of one of the production trucks. I was just so angry. Um, I couldn't. I like, like that it was a Yoohoo bottle. Yeah. Though. I don't know why it was a Yoohoo. To this day, I'm like, I don't drink a lot of Yoohoo, but <laughs> maybe it was just one of those road trips where there wasn't a lot of options. Um, yeah, I, I didn't, at that point, all you know confidence in the world and 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 i didn't see it coming either but that's really what my career has become and it, all three times we've talked i feel like that's an important thing is especially you know i'm looking at potentially wrestling roman reigns at wrestlemania or Sami Zayn at wrestlemania Sami Zayn seems so improbable but my career has really been a story of the improbable okay how can stardust uh, be the guy to go and be part of this work great group in the Bullet Club in Japan? Or how can he ascend to the top of that? Oh, can they get 10,000 seats without a machine behind them? Yep, they can. Oh, can they get this alternative on another t television? Yep, they can. That's really the number one thing in my playbook is being when people bet against and when the goalposts move. So no, I didn't see it. Um, it's like a light bulb went off at the Royal Rumble particularly. I was telling my buddy this the other day. I don't want to take this for granted, but I, I came to the live events um, last week, Columbus, Pensacola. I love being on the live events, by the way. if you can, The Garden is a live event. If you come to the live oh, events, so good. you get a different, you get a different, different vibe from me as well. And yeah. I looked out and it was just three rows deep of these nightmare family weight belts, these little plushies, and... I, I remember telling him, you know, I'd only ever seen that for two guys, Roman and and John. And I was saying like, hey, if it was just one weekend, it was the best weekend ever. But how, how what's happening here? Why is this happening? And why is it happening now? You, you know, I'm I'm in the entering the prime of my career, but I've been doing this for a minute too. What was the holdup? And I, I guess I just chalk it up to in the rumbles where the light bulb went off for me. I feel like I have found myself. I probably said this before in an interview too, where, hey, I found myself. I know who I am. <laughs> right. No, no, but it's different. It, it can hit different. I feel like I found myself and it's a really calm place to be in when you found like, no, this is what I do. Uh, I'm not the best at this. I've tried it. That's how I know. But this is what I do. And this is what I can offer, particularly to Monday Night Raw. But that was just, again, when we spoke, I remember that interview pretty vividly. Um, I remember that whole morning because it was 6 a.m. Yeah, it's, it's a nightmare. Yeah, ra uh, Radio Row at, uh, at Mania, right, is what yes. it was? It's um, so funny. That used to be my favorite thing to do. Yeah. And now that I, uh, I've been fortunate enough to do the kickoff shows and I don't really do radio anymore, yeah. I like. I also don't miss it because it's so early. It's such an awkward time to have to interview someone. It's like 6.20 yeah. a.m. I think it's too, it's awkward too. Like it's great to interview all the talent about WrestleMania, but it's hard when you're not – on WrestleMania, you know, well, yeah, you get people sometimes you're like I don't know what to talk about. So yeah, it's, it's they might be bummed out. It, like it, there are people who are bummed out who are there. Oh, of course, it's imagine this. It we just had the Super Bowl. WrestleMania is the Super Bowl for us. If you're not playing in the game, yeah, doing media is not as fun. It's not. It's 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 honestly almost not fun because I mean, but it's a great learning lesson. Okay, how do I help out my peers? What can I do? But. You know, you don't always think that way. Uh, no, of course well, not. Yeah. Um, you, you, you mentioned the goalposts moving a bit, and I think they did. This is something we've talked about a lot on the show, um, and I'm sure you've heard this conversation. 
Two things. One, you talked about you could be facing Sami Zayn. Mm -hmm. I feel like in many ways you're facing Sami Zayn no matter what. Yeah, that's probably. This, because <laughs> the whole thing is yeah. how can how can Cody make people care as much about him as they care about Sami Zayn? Yeah. Which has been, I think all would agree, one of the most fun storylines in recent memory that we yeah. can recall. It's been, I mean, Montreal this weekend is going to be mm -hmm. uh, kind of, I think, up there for, you know, best. You think Canadian Stampede. Uh, you think Money in the Bank in Chicago. Chicago is what I was so, thinking of. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. This is going to be special. So is does it feel unfair, though, that now that has kind of been thrown no. in the mix, too? No, because it's like you said, it's another goalpost. Also, I really like Sammy, and I really respect him. And for, I feel like, two years, maybe less, people have been wanting these viable contenders to dethrone the greatest champion of our era, and it never seemed like there was one. Now you have two options. And the way I look at it is give them everything. And the way you give him everything is Sammy's wrestling at the Elimination Chamber in his hometown against Roman. And then right now, me and Roman are, if he, Roman moves on from that, we're wrestling at WrestleMania at the biggest WrestleMania of all time. Again, the odds are, I'd say, you, you don't want to bet against Roman Reigns, but there are a lot of odds in the favor of Sammy Zayn. I have no... I've been, I've been wondering this on the media day to day. If people ask me, who would you rather? I don't have a who would you rather. I don't. I, I punched my ticket, and I can't apologize for that. That's what I say to any of people who are, I guess, maybe more pro Sammy than pro Cody. But I, I like, I like it all. And if uh, if I get there and it is Roman and I'm able to get past the mound, then Sammy's going to be one of the first guys I have to look look at in general. But I'm just happy the options are there. There were no options. You couldn't think of anyone viable. Right really. and now, there's more options. And again, like you mentioned, the goalpost. That's my whole career, man. That's my whole, oh, okay, well, they can get this. He got this, but he's not going to get this next piece. Well, I got the next piece. Okay, let me ask you one more question about the rumble and getting there. Here is my one concern. It's been a yeah. major point of contention on the show, and I'm sure you've heard this too. I can't wait. I wrote you, and yeah. I said, really, no surprise? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I didn't like, I didn't want the promo for your turn. Sure. I wanted the surprise. Yes, everyone kind of would have expected yeah. it, but I, I, I'm one of those people who lives for the surprise pop at the rumble, and yeah. I, I just kind of wanted it. So I asked you, I was like, oh, no surprise. Then you're number 30. Yeah. Then you win the Rumble. Yeah. So you got sort of the trifecta of, as a fan, you kind of have an expectation that this guy is going to WrestleMania. Sure. Do you in any see that? Do you in any way see that as a hindrance, or am I overreacting? Like when no. I said, I was like, oh, this might be making it harder for him by giving us the promo. Number 30, winning. Is it too much? I think that's a great point of uh, contention to your point and really up to the fans to decide the way I look at it is this I want fans to know when I again forever it was I'm going to do this no he can't do this I'm going to do this no they can't do this I'm telling you now this time this is what I'm going to do I'm telling you Joe name of style I'm, call, <laughs> right. I'm Call calling the shot and I think there's something that I do like. I really didn't have an opinion on whether it should be a surprise or not, but I do think there's something about, especially as a character that is being received positively and warmly, hey, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And you're you're going to take the ride with me, but what I'm saying is going to happen. And I think there's something powerful in that messaging. Again, it's up to fans. Oh, he should have been a surprise, and maybe it would have been a different if it was a surprise. Or number 30, not number one. I mean, again, it's... Uh, for me, what I think is powerful is calling it and able and actually executing it. Now, I don't know if that luck runs out on me because I'm here. I am calling what's going to happen at WrestleMania. But for me, at this point in my career, entering the prime of my career, having the best education of any wrestler or superstar in the business and finally be able to cash in all those points, I'm confident in calling it. And I hope people can – I hope fans of mine and critics as well can go, okay, well, let, let me watch. I'm going to follow this. And I think just having seen those live events and just seeing some of the metrics as far as uh, I'm concerned on the shows, I'm. Uh, it seems like people are vibing with it. There is a, there's a, it's a discussion. Yeah. But a discussion's the best. It's, well, no, uh, and you also yeah. had last week. So if there are people like me who are like, I don't know, is it being too force yeah. fed? Then you all of a sudden have this moment with Paul last week, mm. and you get the story. Now we know what the story is. Like, the, it, you guys did such a beautiful job telling us a story. Yeah. I wasn't even thinking about the history <laughs> between 
the two families. Yeah. And of course, Paul is is Paul. So I mean, he he did and he did great work with Sammy then on Friday as well. Um, He's amazing. Yeah, you're in a pretty good spot with who you're. Well, working with too. One of the things I, I about the interview, I'm glad people. It was one of those where I didn't really look at it as an interview, or you know, I see some of the, I see all the discussion. We, how can you not? Um, but all I really wanted was whether it be on screen or behind the scenes, whatever. All I really wanted was him to hear the version from me, because that was very sincere and that changes a kid at that impressionable age where you're counting your okay this person's an ally this person's an enemy whatever you know i'm gonna i'm gonna get this guy i'm gonna take care of this guy i wanted him to hear the story because i know we're going to war i know that that, that that there's nothing that that paul Heyman isn't gonna say or do i mean as you as, as we saw and found out but i wanted before all that like the respect is still there he's still mr Heyman to me and he will remain that i just cannot repay that however the best way to honor mr Heyman, the best way to do that is to beat his boy is 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 again it's like honoring being a second or third generation great they're amazing and you do their moves and the crowd reacts but that reaction is really not for you as much as it's for them it's okay to sprinkle that in but you also have to he said the most important thing in that interview that i took and it wasn't the last line it was when he said this is about you and i I took that as very much, it, it, it has to be, because he's, you know, old man's not here with me, brother's not here with me, it is just me. I'm the island of one uh, against this island of relevancy, and that was a very nice thing to hear in a contentious interview segment that I'm glad people enjoyed. But also to your point, just from watching the show, I do think there's more layers enjoy everything that's happening with Sammy, and if Sammy is my opponent at WrestleMania, don't be surprised. Um, now as we get close to WrestleMania here and he's got his whole bloodline, I mean, are we going to get Brandy, the baby, the, the Husky? <laughs> I mean, we... I think, I think, uh, you know, Pharaoh, my Husky is like 12 years old. He was in the, the, the videos to come Pharaoh's back. 12? He's 12. Yeah. My boy's 12 too. He's just an old man dog now. Uh, he really is just, he, is he still doing pretty good? Yeah. He's really spry for 12. So, so is mine. And I isn't like the that, worst? Man. You're like... You want to enjoy it, but you keep like waiting for yeah. it to turn. You, the like, best, the best thing is don't wait because I know, just like, these dogs are living in like sixteen, seventeen now. Versus, so you don't want to waste five years yep. being waiting for something bad. Yeah, no. You, I know, I, I know. Cause when I see you on social, I know, like me, you, you love your freaking. Oh, dog. Pharaoh's my guy. He was, he's, he's just my. We're very bonded with one another, and now he's very bonded with Liberty. Uh, as far as he, she kind of just puts her, her hand on his back mm. and. That's how she walks around the house, and he's there with her every step of the way. Uh, as far as Brandy's concerned, you know, uh, I, I, I never know. We, we always, I like my dad. When Brandy got in, I went, Whoosh. you got to do your own thing and, and 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 be your own self. And I'm so proud. When I talk about what we built, there's a reason why I name everybody in it. You know, without Matt, Nick, Kenny, Tony, Bernie, Brandy, Dana, it would have never happened. All those names have to be included because it was so fragile, so fragile. And I'm so proud of what she did and her, her contributions to it. If uh, I'm Roman Reigns, I'm not necessarily scared of Brandy Rhodes. But if I'm Mr. Heyman, I would be scared <laughs> of, uh, of a potential uh, of what, what could happen. But she's really enjoying watching this. And my whole family, uh, not that they've come out of the woodwork. They've always been big supporters. But I'm very... Uh, for mania because i've never been in this situation before i've gotten everything really organized in advance okay everyone's got their rooms okay there's a big family dinner even if i can't make it i want you guys to be together brandy's family and my family just because the last time it was like this with 2007 when my dad went into the hall of fame and then my journey started and it's different so you don't want to take it for granted would i love to be on top and punch the ticket again at Liberty Financial in Philly, one of my favorite wrestling towns. And if you're from Philly, you know why, because of Money in the Bank, where everyone decided to choose me for this loser's club Money in the Bank that they called it internally, which was, ugh. But um, I may not, you know, you, you never know. Again, it was hard to call with Stardust. It's hard to call what happens in this room now, where we're going to be next. That's the beauty of what we do. Last and hardest question. Oh, sure. Well, why, why go... Why go with the full neck tattoo? 
<laughs> it's a, I, I don't know if this is a good answer, but it's the true answer. I, again, it comes back to rock in this weird way. I loved the American Nightmare logo. As soon as it was ha out, Ryan Barkin, one of his artists, had put it together. I bought it up. I was like, I got to have that. That's, that's it. You know, like I said, I, I found myself, right? Right, right? I said, that's it. I mean, you can change it and you can put different state flags and country flags, blah, blah, all this good stuff. But I really wanted, uh, I was watching Conor McGregor. He had that big chest tattoo. I thought I'd really like this iconic piece of ink. And I don't even like tattoos. The one on my chest is for my dad. It's like an emotional tattoo. I said, I really want this. I said, maybe the chest. Said, no, he's got it on the chest. Well, maybe the arm. No, but Rock's got it on the arm. Rock's uh, everything on the arm. And I didn't want to be ashamed. But originally it was just the Brahma bull. Right, right? exactly, like the, the bull. Thing, yeah. Which, by the way, a fun fact, Sean Spears has a Brahma bull there that he had to put a panther on top of when he got into the business. So if you ever look deep into the pan, if the panther's still even there, it's one of my favorite people. He's the godfather to liberty, wonderful guy. Didn't mean to oust him. But um, I wanted this brand, and I didn't want to be ashamed of it. And I'm certainly not because it sits on my neck. And that was where I, I chose. And I told everybody in advance, I was like, just you guys know, I'm going to, I'm coming to this pay-per-view with this. The tattoo is going to be on. I'm getting it two days before the pay-per-view. I'm going to wear a scarf at this press conference today. I'm, I'm just getting it done. And, uh, I don't think anyone believed me. And then it, and then I, I, I had it and everyone's like, we'll expand it. Go down your arm now. I don't think I'm ever going to, this is it. This is it. And how I, does Brandy feel about it? This is the most important question. Let's be honest. Um, I think initially she made some jokes about it online. She kind of played it by like, Hey, the you know, wrestling world is really poking fun at it. So she'll poke fun at it <laughs> right. uh, too. Uh, she, I don't think she really has an opinion and I always wear a suit anyways. Well, that's what makes it look unique, though, and, and I is think, that you're one of the best put together guys. So it's an interesting look to then have like a yeah. very noticeable neck tattoo. I, I, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, I really love it. And the more time that goes by, I love it. I, I joke it's a little bit bigger than I thought it would be for <laughs> sure, but it's just become part of. It was jarring, sure, to see it at first, but it's become part of what the American nightmare really is as we developed it. Because when I came back, I had this wonderful return. Nothing's changed. Did, that, Vince, did Vince didn't say anything about it? No, there is a fun moment where his, I had such a great conversation with him. If I had not decided to come back, I still walked out of that meeting with him feeling really good. I, bought him, I, I brought him the old WWWF title to show him because wow. I have it. You know, Dan Lambert gave it to me and uh, for free, shockingly. But... Uh, he, he just made a comment. He goes, you know, we could, we have the best artists and creative services department in the world. We could come up with some new logos for you. And I remember I just leaned in and kind of went like that <laughs> and showed him. And he just did one of those classic laughs. Like, oh, never mind. It's, it's, that's it. That's it. So that's, you know, he, he knew we really can't change it at this point. <laughs> this is, this is what it is. And he said something really great to me that day. I was really, you know, I stood my ground. I said, I don't want to change a thing about myself, include my song. Uh, I want to have my elevator. I want all this. And he said something. He goes, well, it's, that's what we're buying. It's not broke. And I thought, that feels good. Because wow. I hadn't figured it out when I was here the first time. Everything was broke. And uh, that was a nice feeling. Cody, thank you so much for stopping by, man. Oh, thank you very much. Man. The great Cody Rhodes.